Yeah, thank you, Joel. Um, you know, what an opportunity to be here today. And I think about people in your life that have given the opportunity. And, and Joel was one of those people who asked or allowed me to come to K-State. And, and really, Bob Toller at South Dakota State was the one who directed here. And it's always fun to see Bob, you know, sponsoring folks. And now I'm back up near Brookings and, and able to, to work with Bob almost on a, a weekly basis. And so I was telling Roger earlier, it's a, it's a you know, life has a way of reminding you about things. When I was a grad student, we went to Iowa State and we, we got to tour the D-Lab and Roger had just started, I, I think like that year, a year before, and he was telling us all the tens of thousands, there's 100,000 cases that they get a year, and I just remember thinking to myself, man, who would want to deal with all those veterinarians? <laughs> Flash forward four years, I work for a company that has 42 veterinarians. You know, some might say that's maybe 41 too many, but I, you, I'll let you guys decide. But, you know, I think just interesting where, where we end up in life. So today, I'm going to do my best to, you know, I'm only 33 years old, so I'll do my best to talk about the past, the present, and where we're headed. I, I think there's certainly other people in this room who've got similar or more uh, thoughts into, into what I'm going to go through here today. So. Shortly, I'll just give a little bit of a background on who Pipestone is, a little bit about myself, and then I'll kind of walk through past, present, future, and, and then maybe some closing thoughts at the end. So before I do anything, though, the reason I'm able to come here today and, and really full circle is able to take the whole family down to Manhattan. We're going to enjoy the town yesterday and tomorrow. My beautiful bride, Karis, and our three kids, Hayes, uh, the youngest, and Addie, and then Brooks, my oldest. So really appreciate them supporting me in all we do. And uh, I think my team and Pipestone certainly always appreciates there's a lot of nights out on the road away from family and so we certainly appreciate uh, the folks that allow us to do that. So I googled KSU Swine Day when Joel asked me to speak because I was trying to find the logo for the, for the Swine Day. And I go to Google Images and this is like the fifth image that's on there, which I don't know. <laughs> I think Steve was going to win some kind of an award maybe. I, I don't know, but he had to do a photo shoot, so at the time I was managing the SCW, uh, which is uh, near the swine unit here in town, and I looked at this picture and just thought, man, look at that guy's hair. <laughs> and, and then I got a little sad and had a, kind of a moment of silence. You know, like you were saying earlier, some guys like Bob or Doc Hines, they don't age, but I'm not quite as lucky, so I can appreciate... Uh, you know, my past year, which is unfortunately not that long ago, and uh, I've not aged overly well. Doc, you're looking great, though, so congrats <laughs> to you. <laughs> so at Pipestone, our, our mission is to, to help farmers today create the farms of tomorrow, and, and, and for me, that holds very special meaning. I grew up on a small farm in northwest Iowa. We were farrowed to wean for a while. We contract grew some nursery hogs, and unfortunately, today, there's not really a farm to go home to. And, and that's no fault of my, my dad or my mom and dad or my family, but it just wasn't an opportunity to go home. And so at Pipestone, I get the opportunity to work with farmers every day. And, and there's nothing I love more than sitting down at somebody's kitchen table. They bring you in, they feed you lunch, which is awesome. If you guys know me, I love free lunches. And, uh, but sometimes I get to see two, maybe three generations of farmers sitting at a table. And it's an amazing thing. And so for me, this one's close to my heart to make sure that farmers can stay in business and now we can watch the next generation come home. So Pipestone was founded in 1942 by Dr. Pinkert and Shreem. Still privately owned today. We've got 19 owners, six veterinary clinics, kind of in the upper Midwest. Uh, it was kind of a fun day for me. This is Orange City, Iowa, which is home for me. And Pipestone bought that clinic uh, probably four years ago. And so it was fun to be able to go home, tell my parents about that. And now I get to go down there every once in a while and stop by and say hi to mom and dad and have some coffee. We also have international offices in Mexico and China. And so really, you know, to summarize what we do, I can, in three words, services, partnerships, and purpose. And so some of our services today you know, we have a typical veterinary clinic. We do a little bit of companion animal, large animal work, large distributor of animal health products. We have a management arm, which is what probably most people know us by. Today we manage about 300,000 sows here in the U.S., about another 80,000 sows in Mexico, and then we own or manage some farms in uh, China. Of the farms in the U.S., we don't own any of those sows. They're all independent farmer owned, we manage those sow farms for them. We have a research team and a, and a marketing team really to help farmers negotiate packer contracts. 
And then where I spend most of my time is in the nutrition division today, which I'll talk a little bit more here about in a second. So I talked about partnerships as one of the other things we do. Two of our main partnerships you maybe have or haven't heard of. One is called Riverstone, which is actually our Chinese entity. The one place we do own some sows. We'd love someday to be offer that, offer that opportunity to some of our domestic partners here in the US. And then Holstone. So three years ago this December coming up, with 220 independent farmers, Pipestone was able to purchase the Hormel plant in Fremont, Nebraska has been an amazing thing for us. Uh, I'm glad we got into it when we did. So two of the partnerships, we certainly have others, but these would be the two main that we partner with producers in today. The last one is purpose, and I think just like any other company, you know, we try to give back to the places we live and work, and, and one for me is the Meet the Need campaign. I know there's many in this room today that have actually donated to that, and so one, thank you for your for your money, honestly. We've been able to provide food to a lot of folks, feeding South Dakota, feeding Iowa, a couple of different things, and so that's really fun. It's one I personally get a chance to go and, uh, and help with, and then a bunch of other different areas where uh, Pipestone tries to give back. So, I don't know who Anna Sewell is, but you know it's good people who make good places, and, and there's really no place else where I think that's more true than, than my own team, and so, this is the Pipestone Nutrition to Deem today, minus I think Ark and Wu, who had just flown out to go back home to China. Um, you know, I, I won't have a chance to maybe mention everybody, but I do just want to, you know, say one more thing, and it's about people who give you opportunities. And for me, Casey Neal, I think, is still here. Uh, you know, Casey rolled the dice and hired me to come work at Pipestone. Uh, five years ago, this week actually, is when I moved from Manhattan, or six years ago this week, I moved from Manhattan up to Laverne, Minnesota. And I think probably 100 or maybe 150 days out of the year, Casey maybe isn't quite sure about his decision. <laughs> the other days, I, I think, uh, you know, things go pretty well. But no, I really do appreciate Casey giving me the opportunity. And for the rest of the team, you know, they really do the lion's share of the work. I just kind of get to show up um, a few days out of the week. So really appreciate this team. And on the nutrition side, you know, today we work with about 100 wean to finish customers, you know, across the upper Midwest. This is just kind of a map of where we're active today. You know, we do feed about 450,000 sows. Some of those are the sows that we manage. Some are external. You know, we've got 130 different feed mills. Roger was asking me earlier, how many feed mills do you send diets to? Something Jenna Hoglid would know, but something north of 130. It's, it's a lot, too many. 13 different states. And really we do two things in our, in our department today. One is formulate diets for, for independent farmers and others. And the second thing is procurement. And so Casey really leads our formulation and, and nutrition team. And then Amber Pugh leads our procurement arm today. So the past. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. So this is one of my favorite slides. Who, who can remember this? So this is the pride of the farm. I think there's a few other ones. Who can remember that first feeder on the left? I can. I can remember laying in my bed at night about July 15th. It's finally cooled off at night, and all you can hear all night is bang, bang, bang. <laughs> but the pigs were eating at night, and that was a good thing to hear. And then we transitioned. We, we brought pigs inside, and does anyone remember this? The green Osbournes? I personally do because I carried a lot of feed to fill them suckers up. And then we moved to the two feeders, and some of those are still in existence today. I, I see a lot of them sitting in groves at the moment, but we moved to a two feeder, and, and then we kind of transitioned to a dry feeder, right? The big tub dry feeder is still a good feeder. And then the new feeder today is kind of the wet dry, and I think I've even seen some of us going back now to some of these circular, uh, it's not Osborne, but maybe Rotecna is making some bigger feeders like that that are poly. So I think it's always interesting just to look back and, and see how we've and this wasn't that long ago, right? 30 years ago, we were feeding pigs outside in hoop barns. And, uh, and today, we, we do things quite a bit differently. So what's changed? Scale, right? I can remember our own operation. We were 50 sows, fair to wean, 50 sows. Then guys were raising 100 sows, 500 sows. Then in the 90s, others, Pipestone included, started building 1,500, 3,000 head sow farms. Last year we built our first 10,000. I know there's people in this room that work with South Farms much bigger than that. So the scale of how we produce pigs has changed dramatically. Labor. What was the labor 30 years ago? Me, my dad, my brother, right? 
it was kids. If you wanted more labor and wanted to raise more pigs, you had to have more kids. <laughs> so my parents had five, so I don't know, they must have thought they were going to raise a lot of pigs someday. You know, in efficiency, you know it's not very efficient? Me and my brother trying to go do chores, right? But today we're much more efficient how we manage labor, how we manage space, how we manage our assets, right? They're just bigger, size, scale. Performance, it was a great day when we could wean seven pigs. Then it was 10 pigs. Now today, if we don't wean 12 pigs, Troy Wilbur, our head of production, is coming to Casey's phone and he's lighting them up for some nutritional reason why we can't wean 12 pigs per sow. So performance has changed. You know, I can remember Matt Culbertson talking a couple of years ago at an event, and, and I'll probably get this wrong, but he was saying, I think this was three years ago already, they're top indexing boars and the nucleus level, we're doing 2.2 wean to finish average daily gains. And so if we think back, that should be the future, right? And we've seen that. We used to, when I started, 1.6 was a good number. I see 1.7s, 1.8s. I've seen a 2.0 wean to finish average daily gain. That's phenomenal, crazy performance, right? These pigs are just different. And then consolidation, unfortunately. Good or bad, depending on how you look at it. If you're the one getting consolidated, not so good. If you're the one doing the consolidating, it's all right. But the industry is consolidated. So as I look in the past, if you can see this and zoom in, hopefully this works a little bit. This is actually the DeYoung Family Nursery. So this is where I spent a lot of my time working. If you look really closely, you'll see there's no feed lines. So I spent a lot of time carrying five-gallon buckets into this nursery. And then my dad was nice enough and... October 12 of 92 or 93, I can't tell if that's a 2 or a 3, but i got to put my handprint on the concrete. So i got to go home a month or so ago to take some pictures of the home place, and some of those other pictures before were actually some of the, the old place. But I think for me it was nostalgic to walk around with Dad, look at a few things, and, and if, you know, Casey's here, I think if anyone can tell me what that is, but Dad's actually got rabbits in the shed now, so he likes fendingling with rabbits now. So, so the present, where are we today? So this is, a, this is a new farm in South Dakota. I shouldn't say new, I think it's three years old now. This roof style is actually our outdated model already just three years ago. But this was, a, I think, a 7,000 head sow unit in South Dakota. Beautiful facility, fully filtered, uh, weans of purrs, micro-negative pig, and a lot of them. 24 days old. It's a great farm. So when I think about today and I go meet with producers, one of the things I like to ask them is, who's the competition? Who do you compete with today? And I get a spackling of answers. You know, somebody says, ah, oh, it's my uncle. Ah, he's doing better than me, right? His pigs are growing a tenth of a pound better. Okay, that's what's my uncle. The next guy says, oh, it's Fred on the corner. That darn Fred, man, he really knows how to raise his pigs. I gotta, I gotta catch up to him. And the next guy might say, well, no, it's the Smith family in the county over i got to compete for them with space every day. They're trying to gobble up my space. And the next guy says the integrator. I don't know what exactly that means, but he says the integrator. And then another guy might say, oh, this foreign integrator. And you can say who that is. And, and then the last guy says, ah, oh, we're competing with China. And I don't know who we're actually competing with here, but I think for me, it's important to know who you are competing with, right? That's important if I'm a producer. I need to know who my competition is. And it might be all six of those. Might be all five of them, or six, however many's up there. And it may just be a few of them, but I think I'll touch on this a little bit in the further down the road here, but you know, I think for some guys we gotta understand maybe my uncle's not the competition, maybe Fred on the corner is not competition, maybe I could collaborate with Fred, maybe Fred and I could share labor. Because labor, as we all know, is hard to come by. Maybe Fred and I can go together and, and buy some ingredient or buy pigs better, right? So I think some folks get, you know, Steve, you said it, some independent cuss, and farmers are independent. It's why they're so awesome, but it's also at times can be a hindrance because I'm competing with everybody. Well, maybe we don't have to compete with everybody. Maybe if we work together, we can get some of those scales and efficiency tied together. So as we look at the current landscape, this is nothing new to talk about today. You know, we tell our producers, you gotta be in the top third for revenue and the bottom third for cost of production. And if I've heard it a lot, got to be the low-cost man, right? We hear that a lot. Got to be the low-cost producer, got to be the low-cost producer. I think that's partially true, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But how can we improve cost of production? 
I fit right in because I think I saw three Venn diagrams earlier in the presentation, so I had to put my own in. But we think, you know, own your assets, increase the scale of in which you do things, and then execute. And so those are three things we think really help benefit cost of production. So what does that mean? Maybe you own the land, maybe you own the sow farm, maybe you own finishing sheds, maybe you own a feed mill, maybe you own a packing plant. So I thought it was interesting. I'm going to go, let's look at cost of production. So the red line on the bottom is the best cost of production. So this is the last 12 months. I pulled data from our meta farms. We've got about two and a half million pigs annually in our meta farms data and said, okay, who's the lowest cost of production in each month? So that's the red line on the bottom. So this is the last 12 months. The blue line is, I guess, the worst, right? The highest cost of production per pig. So you can see feed costs went up. Earlier this year, cost of production has gone up. We had $90 per pig feed cost. But I thought this was interesting. When it was the tightest month, was $14 a pig difference. Some would say, that's a lot. Maybe. On the worst month, the best and worst producers were $30 difference on cost of production. So cost of production is certainly something we need to be focused on. Don't hear me wrong today. What I thought was interesting is when I did this, I graphed the Western Corn Belt, and I went back a little bit further because I wanted a specific data point, so I cherry-picked a little. I went the last 22 months and looked at the red line, which is the Western Corn Belt, and there's a lot of contracts out there today that sound something like Western Corn Belt plus something, right? That's a fairly common packer contract in the industry. And then I said, okay, maybe some lucky guy gets 93% of the cutout. Let's graph those over time. So if I look at that, on one day in May, so this was in the middle of COVID, cash hogs were $30 or, you know, technically they should have been zero, but we were propping them up. They were about $30. On the single day, two producers delivered, delivered hogs to a plant. Those pigs stood right next to each other in the building, and then they got killed right behind each other. And one pig was worth $140 a head more than the pig right next to it. Because one guy's on the Western Corn Belt and one guy's getting 93% of the cutout. So, yep, cost of production is important, but a $30 spread versus $140 spread is a bit of a difference. And so, this for us was a bit of a mindset shift. We pound people on cost of production. But there's massive ranges on revenue the haves and the have not. So, how do you become a have? Well, a lot of different ways, right? One is try to get that 93% of the cutout contract. That's not always the easiest thing to go do. But I think it's important to understand that the spread on revenue is pretty significant in our industry today. The spread on cost of production has tightened down. Everyone is a pretty good producer when it comes to cost. So on the revenue side, value add opportunities. We're all aware of these. Paling, right? That used to be get a premium. You guys remember that? When there was a premium for not feeding paling? Don't get that today, but there was at one point. Now it's Duroc, maybe a large white Duroc. You get a premium, or maybe you just are told you got to feed Duroc. OPG, which is open pen gestation. Loose stall housing, call it what you want. Prop 12 is the new one. There's premiums out in the market today for Prop 12 pigs. Pretty significant cost to go down that route, but there are premiums out there for Prop 12. Antibiotic free, I don't have it up here, that's another one. So there's opportunities to increase, increase the revenue, right? But I thought this was interesting. So I work with a producer in Michigan. They raise about 60,000 pigs a year. About six months ago when I was out there, they were talking about their packer contract. Pretty good contract, they were pretty happy with it. And they told me, yeah, about a year ago, they start the that specific plant started offering a premium for OPG pigs, loose stall house sows, if the pigs came from a sow farm that was loose stall house. They didn't have that, but other producers were getting a premium, and we saw that out in the upper Midwest by us as well. So that was the first thing. There was a premium that was out there. The second thing that happened about six months later, they told me, well, we kind of stopped getting our preferred dock times because they weren't OPG. They used to be able to load at 6, 7 in the morning, six, seven at night. Now they were loading at 11, 12, one in the morning. Not very fun times to go load pigs. So they lost their preferred dock time. Now there's no premium. So the guys who are in loose stall housing aren't getting a premium anymore, but it's kind of required. And I kind of made this one up. 
But this is coming, right? If you don't do something, you're probably going to get discounted. At our own plant in Holstone, there's things that we'll just tell you if you're not going to do them, you're going to take a discount. And so this is kind of the progression. And if I look at this, and I'm them, I kind of wish I would have done something up here, right? When there was a premium available, right? But I think a lot of guys, whether you believe in this list of stuff or not, I'm not here to argue with anybody. Most I'd probably not super excited about. But we could dig our heels in and say, no way, I'm not going to go put my stalls out in loose housing. I'm not going to do what some person in California tells me to do on the Prop 12. But I would just say, this has happened. I've watched this over and over again with producers, this stage of events. First there's a premium, then there's no premium, then you're getting discounted. You may or may not agree with it, but I think there's value in looking at. We don't need to be on the bleeding edge of some of these changes, but I'd certainly like to go get some of those premiums that are out there. I may have to give up a few things and, and maybe be in disagreement, but there's an opportunity there to do that. So here's a chart I put together, and it's over, uh, you know, oversimplified, and, and uh, it, it may or may not be right for everybody. But this is kind of how I think about, you know, those who own and control their assets are usually one of the better at cost of production, right? So if we start over here on the left, and this is how much or how much control or how much ownership you have of the assets in the, in the production system, and on the bottom, we have the size of the operation. So over here on the left, this is me in 2005, I'm Freddie Foracher, my dad, we got five Duroc sows and we own those sows and I don't own the shed, but dad does and, and we got pretty good control over our five sows. And, and then this was my dad in the 90s. We own the shed, we own the feed mill, if you can call the Case IH grinder a feed mill, but we had it, I watched dad grind feed a lot. We own the building. And we had pretty good control of most of the assets. The problem was we were feeding 100 sows and we just didn't have the efficiency. And so then, again, oversimplified here, but we saw a lot of folks switch to a different model, which was buying wean pigs to fill 1,200 head barns that you rented from the guy next door so you could put manure back on your land. And maybe in this scenario, you're a co-op member, and so you get feed from the mill in town. Well, I just go through that list, and I don't own any of those assets. I don't own the sows, I don't own the building, I don't own the feed mill, and if I'm being totally honest, I don't have a ton of control of what's going on in my operation. So as those operations got bigger though, and, and some of those are here today, and you see them in the industry, they got smart. So now I'm going to control some of those assets because I think that's important. So as we go up, we start seeing people own their feed mill, own the sow farm, own the finishing barn, and then if you get further to the right, you know, own a packing plant. It's actually the K-State feed mill if you're looking closely enough. But yeah, folks are owning packing plants or harvest facilities. And then if you go even further up the chain, maybe you own Food Co, right? You're selling food in the, in the grocery store. And so that ownership and control of assets is certainly important. So in addition to that, you know, there's risk strategies that are involved with, with how we raise pigs. You know, what's your ability to withstand market changing events? And I'm gonna show you here in a little bit. We've had a ton of them in the last five years alone, and I don't see that slowing down. How flexible is your operation? How quickly can you expand or contract? It's a little bit different than the slide I just showed you. Right? I, said, I said control, own all these assets. It's a little hard to contract when things get bad when I've got a bunch of assets sitting there. So there's a balance between being flexible and having control over everything. And then lastly, what's your ability to tolerate risk? And I'll show you here again. We're in a time when the risk and the volatility in the markets is elevated. It's tough, really tough to be a farmer today. So I put down the, some notable events in the last five years, and, and I don't know if it's, it seems like when I started working, there was probably one, two years where things were kind of steady. You know, I could feed a corn, soybean meal distiller diet, change diets two, three times a year, life was pretty simple. So if I go back a little bit further though, 2014, and that was right before I got out of school, PED, we can all agree that was a pretty market changing event. No more paline. This is kind of the first year we've really felt the effects of that. 2020 we had COVID backed up pigs, so this is probably the first year we've fully have felt the effect of no paline. ASF in China, 2018. I had just gotten my visa, my work visa in July, was supposed to get on a plane at the end of August in 2018 and go visit our China operations. 
They get ASF beginning of August. I've never been there since, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. COVID-19, that alone had its, has a string of events that happened, right? First thing, before the plants got backed up, is the distillers plants stopped making distillers. Crude traded to zero. Do you guys remember when crude, crude traded to zero? Whether that actually happened or not, but it did trade to zero on the board. People stopped driving. There was no demand for ethanol. Distillers plants shut down. So we yanked all the distillers out of the diets. Then the packing plants shut down. And, you know, Mike and, and Bob and Joel, I'll be honest, I'm not sure if you guys are very good teachers because this whole COVID deal, we were really able to slow these pigs down and do a terrible job as nutritionists when we're supposed to make them grow faster all the time. We were actually really good at doing the opposite. So either I wasn't paying attention or you guys aren't very good teachers and, and probably it's the Probably I wasn't paying attention, right? But we actually did a pretty good, good job of slowing pigs down. And then who remembers this? Freak event, snowstorm goes through Texas. They're pretty cold. I guess everyone turned all their heaters on at the same exact instant. Natural gas prices shot through the roof. And I'm a distiller's plant. I'm sitting on a bunch of natural gas that's now worth 10 times what it was a week ago. I shut the plant off. I sell my natural gas. Distiller's plants shut off again. So you can see a lot of this kind of rotates around the distiller's plant, so I don't know what that means. But now, today, global shipping is an absolute disaster. Supply chains are a pain in the butt. And I know every one of us in this room has to deal with that every day. Lysine, trading over $2 a pound. It was under 60 cents a year ago. North of $2.50, I watched it trade hands in Minnesota three weeks ago. Incredible. Some of this in this room affected packer line speeds were reduced. I think we're actually going to maybe get a little reprieve from that, hopefully by the first of next year. Packer line speeds were reduced. Now today our administration is incentivizing the biodiesel. No fat to be found on the market. If it is, it's pretty darn expensive. We yanked all the fat out of most of the diets. Prop 12 mandates, right? What's next? We talked about preparedness and, and prevention on ASF, and I'll just say, if that doesn't happen and ASF gets here, and I, I pray every day it doesn't, but if it does, we're all gonna be doing some things very, very differently. And so, like earlier I talked, how flexible is your operation? ASF gets here, 30% of our exports disappear overnight, potentially for six months or longer. Can your operation withstand that? Can you flex and contract enough to make it through that? So lessons learned from COVID, I just kind of threw this in here today, but one thing is farmers are incredibly resilient and creative. And I watched this over and over again last spring. It was incredible. One producer in particular called Prairie Queen in Nunda, South Dakota, just south of Brookings. Again, they sell about 60,000 pigs a year annually. Some of those pigs go to Holstone, some of them go to Sioux Falls. If you all know, the Sioux Falls plants was one of the earliest ones to shut down, and it was shut down for a while, two to three weeks, if I remember correctly. No pigs were getting killed. They had pigs backed up in their barns. It was decision time, making some really tough decisions. What they decided, we're not going to make tough decisions. We're going to get creative. They sold over 2,500 pigs out the back of their barn straight to the consumer. And that was just one producer. We saw that happen over and over and over again. Our estimates would say there's somewhere between maybe 10 and 30,000 pigs or more that got sold direct to consumer in 2020. A phenomenal thing, right? So uh, they ended up not having to euthanize any pigs. I worked with some producers who did have to euthanize fat hogs. You want to talk about a terrible day? That's one of them. So I thought this was interesting. My sisters in-law's sister is the department secretary of ag in oregon so i knew a lot of our pigs were headed to oregon that's what i heard is we got trailers going to oregon with pigs in the middle of COVID. so i talked to her she connects me with the state vet and so i called him a couple weeks ago said hey you have any idea how many pigs came into the state of oregon back in 2020 and the first question i said how many pigs are in oregon which i didn't know Five thousand is what he estimated the population is in, in oregon and we actually have an oregon night here somewhere kia I don't know where she is, but she's from Oregon, one of our swine nutritionists. 5,000 pigs in the state of Oregon. He estimated they brought in, in 90 days, 10,000 additional fat hogs from the Midwest. Pretty phenomenal. Guys are creative. We figure out ways to get things done. I say we, I mean the farmers. They figure out ways to get things done. And then the second thing is COVID affected all of us, whether you believe it or not. 
I do year-end reviews with folks. 93% of the people I did year-end reviews, I said, what's the worst thing that happened in 2020 in regards to our job? Not, not in life. This is a job review. Every, or 93% of them, COVID. Things that was out of their control that affected the people we work for was the worst thing about their year. Something out of our control, but it was COVID. It affected all of us. So that's the present. What's happening in the future? Check my time here. Perfect. So one thing is I think we've got to be able to withstand market volatility. One thing that we focus on is identifying outside profit centers, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Transparency when you're working with a service provider. That's, that's me. That's what I do every day. I'm the service provider. I have to provide value. There's people in this room that provide that role with producers. We have to provide value versus value taken, right? A farmer's going to make that decision every day. That's why we get hired and fired. Understand who the competition is. Maybe it's not the guy down the road. Maybe I need to start working with the guy down the road so I can compete at a larger level. We know we need size and scale to compete in the industry. If you don't have size and scale, life is very, very difficult. And then lastly, need to get ways to advance into the food chain. Livestock Co., we've, most farmers have that today. Harvest Co., that's harvesting pigs, and then, and then maybe someday Food Co., right? That's the ultimate form of integration to some extent. So Mark, I'll tell you, I just want to touch on this. I thought this was interesting. This was a gut feeling that I had, and maybe I manipulated the data to make this work, but this is the percent change week to week in distiller's pricing going back to 2016. It's the longest I could go back and get data. It was actually an Iowa State thing that I pulled it from. Probably should have cited it, but I did. But the percent change week to week. So typical from 16 to 20 was about 2.5% change in the price of distillers from week to week. Since 2020, March, really enter COVID, it's almost doubled the price change on a week-to-week -week basis in distillers. Makes my life very complicated trying to formulate diets when the price of distillers jumps in all over the board. Lean hogs, so this is the CME lean index. I was able to get data all the way back to 2010. Again, about 3% change week-to-week -week in the CME lean hog close on Friday. Starting in January of 18, so actually a little bit before COVID, you could call this maybe ASF in China. We again see the market volatility almost doubled in the last four years since 2018. That makes it a little bit more complicated to minimize our risk when the markets are going all over the place. We just expanded the limits, I think, 60 days ago. You know, a max move on the hog market now, I think, is over $7 in one day. And so those limits have expanded, and the markets. And they've expanded for a reason, because the market's showing more volatility. So you've got to have the ability to withstand that. So profit centers in the chain. You know, some of these are a little old, but, you know, a sow farm can be a profit center. If I don't own the sows and I'm buying wean pigs from somebody, I would expect them, if they own the asset, to have a little bit of profit when they sell the wean pig to me, right? That makes sense. But if I own the sows, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a profit center anymore. It should be a cost center. Buying station, can you remember when we used to ship fat hogs to a buying station? I think there's still a few of those actually that exist, but we've kind of gotten rid of that, right? We're selling direct to the packer, getting rid of a profit center. Barn construction, trucking companies, packing plants, the grocery store, restaurants, wean pig brokers, feed mill, feed salesman, is this guy, right? I'm a profit center. Hopefully there's enough value there that I share with the farmer that we can work together, right? But all these are profit centers, a management company. Again, that's Pipestone. Veterinarians, that's Pipestone and others in this room, right? We're profit centers in a farmer's chain. And so it's at, up to them to try to find the balance between what is something I can't do myself. I need somebody to do this expertise area, and what am I willing to pay for that? So refresh your mind on this, and then I would just look at this and say, okay, Every person can't be on this side of the graph. Everyone can't have 300,000 sows that they own by themselves, right? That's just not the world we live in at the moment. But what if I could be Lee and Ben Bader? They live in Northeast Iowa. This is Lee or Ben and his kids, and then Lee and his wife, father, son. So three generations in the picture here. Lee and Ben, 
feed 15,000 pigs a year. So if I go back to this slide, they're, they're somewhere over here, right? They're on the left side of the graph. But Lee and Ben have figured out that the guy down the corner is not the competition. He might actually be someone I want to work with. So Lee and Ben raise 15,000 pigs a year. They own all their own land. They raise all their own corn that they feed to their pigs. They own a feed mill. It's not very big, but it's got a micro table and it's automated and Ben knows how to make feed pretty well. They own their finishing barns. They own their sow farm or a portion of the sow farm that they get wean pigs out of. They own part of a packing plant and someday I'm hopeful they can own part of a food company. And so Lee and Ben have got it figured out. I want to work with people so that I can increase my size and scale. And, and Pipestone, I think that's something that we believe in, is trying to get farmers to work together, even though they're independent cusses, I think, Steve. If we can get them to work together and, and work with us or others, we're all better off, right? And we can compete on a global scale, maybe, as opposed to competing against my uncle down the road. And so I think a great story. I love these guys. Thankfully, they gave me permission to put their picture up there, but amazing that a person who raises 15,000 pigs has got second generation coming home and has ownership in all those things. It's a pretty cool story. So we talked about getting up the revenue chain. We're not the first ones at Holstone to figure this out. Triumph is owned by multiple farmers, right? Holstone is owned by 220 independent farmers. If you've seen this news release, $300 million independent farmers are going to start Hopefully this works. I don't know that it will. I hope it does. Independent farmers are going to go build a cattle facility to start harvesting cattle on their own. I think we're seeing a shift in, in folks understanding that that revenue piece, it's hard to compete when you're losing $140 a head compared to the guy next to you. So to wrap up today, you know, own and control your assets. So we talked a little bit about this, right? Can I own it myself or do I need partners? And partners aren't the worst as long as you can get along with them. Right? They can actually be helpful in most scenarios. Do I have the equity required to buy the assets? In this volatility that we're in, highly capitalized projects. We really don't want people, you know, I was talking to, I think, Gordon Spronk a couple days ago. In the 90s, they were capitalizing new construction at 10% equity. 10% equity. I can't even buy a house with 10% equity. Today we won't do anything less than 50 and maybe that number should honestly be higher, right? We don't want to be super levered up. Expertise. Do I have the expertise to do these things? Grind my own feed, feed mill. Formulate the diets. Diagnose disease. Produce 30 pigs per sow per year. If I have the expertise and the ability to do that, I should do it myself. If not, enter a partner that can bring value on those different things. And then labor and time. This is something we find more and more. There's two different pieces of it. One, it's hard to find labor. The other piece is if I'm a farmer, I got a lot of things going on. I'm usually a row crop guy. I might have pigs. I might have cattle. I got about three or four different entities. Do I have time to manage a sow farm? That's 500 sows. Do I want to? You know, Wayne's in here somewhere. Do the $1,000 an hour jobs, not the $10 an hour jobs. I say that to a farmer and he goes, oof. Man, I spend a lot of time doing $10 an hour jobs. Just like me, I mow my own lawn, right? That might be less than $10 an hour, but... So, the point is, is my time better spent doing something different? So I think all these things, something that needs to be balanced, I think they'll be worked out in the future, and I think the future is bright for independent farmers and others in the swine industry, right? But this idea that we're going to compete with everybody, I think we've got to think a little bit differently in terms of that regards. And so, with that, wrap up today. Thanks for your time and I'll answer any questions. Any questions for John? Perfect. You know, the limb picture, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's a great time to be an independent farmer if you're willing to think about things a little bit differently, right? To say I'm going to raise a thousand pigs on my own and compete against the big integrator or the foreign integrator, that's a tough, tough thing to do. 
What we've tried to do is bring those farmers together, right? Get a little bit of that independent streak to the side. Let's work together and increase our size and scale. The consolidation, I hate it, right? I, my, my parents were part of that. We got consolidated out. We don't raise pigs anymore today. For those that are in the industry, I think there's opportunity there. Mom and pop kill facilities, maybe, right? I think getting to the consumer is important. We learned something in COVID there. We could sell a lot of pigs direct to the consumer. Are we gonna do that long-term? Is it viable? Is it efficient? A lot of different questions there. But people actually, I think, enjoyed going to the farm and putting a pig in the back of their truck or sedan, I've seen some of that. People put it in the back of Illumina going down the road. But I think people appreciated that. And maybe we learned something there. And so maybe that mom and pop has some legs. I don't know. Size and efficiency matters at the, at the harvest facility too. But I don't think glim at all. I think, I think there's a lot of hope out there for the independent guy. So the question is, is there a balance between size and efficiency? There certainly is, and, and it's, you know, to oversimplify, it's usually a curve that looks like this, right? A lot of gain to get bigger from an efficiency standpoint. You get so big and those efficiencies start to marginalize out, for sure. And, and then I think we could get too big, right? A big farm, big sow farm. We always said 5,000 was the biggest we'd ever build. Now we've built a few tens. They've worked pretty good. Maybe that's the biggest, maybe it's not, but I think definitely marginal efficiency is gained when you get past a certain size, for sure. Someone have, Steve. So related to that independent cuss mentality, describe how your company manages herding cats. <laughs> I've just always been curious about how you guys can do that and get everybody pulling the rope in the same direction. Yeah, so the question is the, the independent Cuss and I, maybe we're given. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have used that word the whole presentation because they're they're great folks, but they are independent. And uh, how do you how do you manage that and get them to work together with other producers? It's not easy, and and there's a there's a population of independent folks that are going to be independent, right? It's just they won't, and that's fine, right? Go compete on your own, and you're going to do a lot of things really good because you've got that streak, right? That's required sometimes. On the flip side. I think if you bring enough value to bring those folks together, the progress, progress, progressive ones can usually see that. Hey, I'd really like to have a 1,500 head south farm that my two sons can work at, but it can't compete with a 5,000 that's in South Dakota, remote, filtered, PERS, negative, versus my south farm that I want to build in Sioux County, Iowa, which is where I grew up. But there's a lot of pigs there, and we shouldn't be building south farms in Sioux County, Iowa anymore. So some see it, if there's enough value there to give up some of that independence, it's a balancing act, but you gotta have enough value for them to do it.